Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Vayera. We've been learning all about the life of our forefather Avraham. This week's Torah portion of Parshat Vayera concludes with what is considered by most to be Avraham's tenth and ultimate test, the, Akid, the Akedah, which literally means the binding. It's a reference to God's command for Avraham to take his son and offer him as an offering. And the many commentaries that elucidate this enigmatic episode examine it from different angles, how difficult this must have been for Avraham, not to mention for Yitzhak himself, who, contrary to popular portrayal, was no mere slip of a lad, but rather he was a vigorous adult son of 37 years old. He was capable of fighting back and not being accommodating and being bound on the altar. In fact, the Midrash instructs that it was Yitzchak who insisted to his father Abraham that he bind him tightly, let, lest he accidentally and inadvertently, purely as a physical reaction, put up a struggle. But I digress. Back to Abraham. How difficult this must have been for him. How unimaginable. How totally incomprehensible this command must have been to our father Abraham whose lifelong dream, and what a long life, his lifelong dream at the age of 100 was finally realized with the birth of a son whose very conception and birth, by the way, was a total physical miracle, like the existence of the Jewish people today. Not just improbable, but impossible. And then, to receive God's promise that this boy will be the continuation of his line through Isaac shall your seed be called chapter 21 and verse 12, not Yishmael, and then to be told to kill him. This is enough, should be enough, to send any man, presumably even the first of the true believers, into a tailspin. But that's not even the half of it. Until now we're emphasizing the relationship between Avraham and Yitzchak, but what about Avraham's life's work? What was Avraham's life's work? Teaching the world that this very thing was abhorrent to the true God, the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. That this type of thing, human sacrifice that was practiced by the pagans, is exactly what the God of Israel does not want. If there was one thing that Avraham was famous for, that he was known for, it was his very passionate stand against the very type of thing that he was now commanded to do. So just imagine, put yourself there. It took him three days to get to his destination, he's, he's walking along the way. People must be asking him, where are you going? Is he telling everybody along the way, well, I'm going to offer my son as an, as an offering, not like I've been t teaching you my whole life. How embarrassing. Look at the verses from the very beginning of chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, Please take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go away to the land of Moriah and bring him up there for a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, he took his two young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split the wood for a burnt offering and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. This is how chapter 22 begins. We have this expression, after these things. After these things indeed, after the entire lifelong campaign of Abraham, there's so much between these words in this line, after these things, it's referring to a lifetime of achievement, an adventure that would outshine the most thrilling action movie, Abraham's life story, his, his persona, a single bold individual who so much knows, not just believes, but knows that there is a God in this world, that he alone has a personal relationship with him, this one man who took on the entire world and won. After these things, God told him, actually, there is a different ending. So commenting on the words, on the third day, he saw the place from afar, saw the place from afar, the Midrash states, 
he saw from a distance a cloud that was hanging over the top of the mountain, and he said, I think this must be the place that the Holy One, Blessed Be He, has in mind. I think that this cloud that the Midrash describes represents the, the obscurity and the sheer incomprehensibility that Avraham must have been experiencing. This can't be happening. But with all this in mind, all this internal struggle and conflict and the overwhelming nature of this command and Avraham's reaction and all the different angles and aspects to consider, today I want to focus on something completely different. A different part of the mix, a factor, a variable of the story of the binding of Isaac that's not usually emphasized because I think, I maintain, especially now, especially this week, especially in our time, I think that the key to understanding everything about the whole episode of the Akedah, Akedat Yitzchak, the binding of Isaac, the key to really understanding it is the location. When we teach about the Temple Mount, everybody knows that the binding of Isaac took place there at the very spot of the altar in the Temple. But why? Why didn't God tell Avraham to do this somewhere else? What was the reason that Avraham had to travel for three days to one of the mountains of which I will tell you? And notice that just as God, as it were, if you'll pardon me, rubbed it in, made it more difficult for Avraham, so to speak, say to say, actually in order to increase Avraham's reward, because God made it much more difficult for him, he said, your son, your only son, that you love, but yet, at the same time, it was cryptic, it was nondescript description. So too, he doesn't name the Temple Mount explicitly, but rather in an illusion. I'll tell you the place, but not yet. The awesome truth of this incident is that it could not have happened anywhere else. It would actually have had no significance anywhere else. The Akedah, the binding of Isaac, is a command that can only be done in that one location. So Temple Mount is all about dedication, and about showing what we really are inside. Are we everything that we claim to be, everything that we would like to believe we are? This is the place to prove who we really are, a place where you have to be completely real, because it is the center of the universe, the birthplace of Adam, and the one place about which the Creator declares, this is the place where I will show myself to humanity. Look in verse 14, the conclusion of the episode of the Akedah. Avraham called the name of the site Hashem Yireh. As it is said to this day, on the mountain Hashem will be seen. It's not for no reason that the sages of Israel emphasize that the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, to some extent, actually, it's considered to be the classic template, the forerunner of the temple service experience. Now, what do we mean by that exactly? We don't sacrifice children, God forbid, and that God didn't really want Abraham to do that. So what do the sages mean when they say, that there's something about the binding of, of Isaac that was like the laying of the cornerstone in a way. It was the absolute benchmark, template for the temple service. And the Midrash goes on and explains that Avraham, at the time of the binding of Isaac, he experienced a vision there in that place. In the vision, he, he foresaw the establishment of the Holy Temple on this very spot, meaning that he knew that his descendants, Yitzchak's descendants, would come forward to this very same place to continue this legacy of refining what it means to engage in a direct and unfolding personal relationship with the Creator, and that the very same strengths of character, the very same will, that he needed to call forth from the very depths of his being in order to be able to stand that challenge, those are the very same skill sets that his progeny would need in order to bring offerings in the temple. Because bringing an offering in the temple 
and appearing there before God is not an easy thing. It's actually a traumatic experience which makes me check and upgrade and reevaluate my identity as a human being. It's a growing process. You know, there's a teaching, rather esoteric, that the timing was off a little bit in between the lines of the story as we read it in, here in, in uh, the Parsha, and that actually the word of the angel was delivered just a bit late, and indeed Yitzchak perished on the altar, and it was too late. And then he came back to life. And this has very profound implications for the existence of the Jewish people in this world. And also, our sages say, is a proof to the resurrection, because Yitzchak actually came back to life. And I think that one of the things our sages are teaching us is that the secret of coming back to life is plummeting the depths of dedication at the Temple Mount, in the Temple experience. This is what brings us back to life. You know, the verse says, and Avraham built the altar. And the tradition is that actually, he didn't build an original altar, he rebuilt the altar that Adam had built and that had been destroyed at the time of the flood, which Noah had rebuilt, which was again destroyed in the generation of the dispersion. So what does it mean that that's the altar that Avraham built? It means that the theme that was developing through Adam and through Noah, the theme of the attempt to rectify humanity and to solidify our standing in this world and to be standing here for God, that Avraham is the continuation, the continuation of this clarification of man's future, his position, his legacy, and his commitment of what it means to be a man, to listen to God's command and to obey though it may be overwhelming to us, it may, though it may leave us in a cloud of obscurity, that's what it means to be a man. And this could only have happened here in this one place. The challenge of the Akedah could only have been issued for this place. It would have had no significance in any other place. It couldn't have happened in any other place. The location is the key to the experience, and more than the key, the experience is the key Location is the lock. The very nature of the Temple Mount is about getting closer to God. It's about bringing ourselves and bearing ourselves, our true essence. This is what it took from Avraham to withstand this test. It could only happen here in this place because this place is about true selflessness and dedication and the desire to serve God with no ulterior motive. It's about integrity and more than anything, it's about the vision, the universal vision, so beautifully described by the prophets of Israel, the vision of the unity and harmony of all mankind in peace, and recognizing and valuing the sanctity of human life and uplifting the life force of humanity. That's what it means for Hashem to be seen on the Temple Mount. Last week, a man was gunned down in Jerusalem by a Muslim terrorist. His crime was advocating and working towards religious freedom on the Temple Mount, raising awareness of the unfairness, illegality of denying Jews and Christians the right to pray on the Temple Mount. We're all united in prayer for Yehuda's speedy and complete recovery. Indeed, the Temple Mount is all about dedication. It's about this very commitment and faith and about showing what we really are inside. The Temple Mount is the one place that God chose to clarify the human spirit and remind us of our constant relationship with our Creator and what it could be. And what we see, what we feel so clearly, what we understand is that the struggle that began with Avraham, the first Jew, to educate and uplift the world and disengage from all forms of idolatry and paganity that struggle is still going on at the place of the Binding of Isaac, the Temple Mount, the place that after the Akedah, Avraham renamed in the mountain, Hashem will be seen. And it only will be that when we understand that this pl one place, unlike any other, is the key 
to the redemption of the human spirit and the ultimate redemption of the world, it's only then that we can really understand what happened at Akedat Yitzchak, what the binding of Isaac was all about, what the attempted murder of a man advocating for peaceful prayer on the Temple Mount is all about, and just how formidable is the great challenge facing us today to work together with courage, uplifting the dignity of man to do our parts to help make Isaiah's promise in the name of God into a reality in our time. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples.